Guys, what can I say? I'm famous. Other YouTubers are making videos about me. Some, like Lonobox, have even made two videos about me. They are not saying good things, but still, I'm flattered. Lonobox tried to debunk my video about the Nakba. There is a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. He starts by talking a bit about my channel, which is a smart thing to do. To get a good overview, I did the same for his channel and found a lot of pro-Palestinian videos and pro-trans movement videos. Now, this is a really strange combination. I've actually already made a video about this weird progressive-Arab love-hate relationship. Progressives love to side with the Palestinians, while the Palestinians hate everything about the progressive, notably the trans movement. A trans woman represented Israel in the Eurovision 25 years ago. Yes, this is how open and inclusive Israeli society is. In many Arab countries, and in Palestine, you could be killed for being trans. Just a small side note before we begin. This is a video about the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, otherwise known as the Nakba, or the Israeli War of Independence, if that's your thing. So, we're going to talk a good bit about the Nakba, about some of the alternative histories you tend to get from the pro-Israeli side, and why those alternative histories are wrong. First of all, yes, it is totally my thing to call the 1948 war the Israeli War of Independence. Secondly, saying that my history is history and that your history is alternative history, as Lotto Box does here, is perhaps not a great way to start an open-minded discussion. He starts with the story of Dir Yassin. I called it the Battle of Dir Yassin whereas he calls it the Massacre of Dir Yassin, which actually very clearly demonstrates the power of language and different narratives. My video made reference to a video produced by Vox. In the introduction, they acted as if they were uncovering a huge untold story, the story of Dir Yassin. But as I point out, it is actually the opposite of an untold story. There are very few events in history that have received as much coverage in the media and academia as the story of Dir Yassin. Lolo Box leaves out the part where I talk about Vox and instead point out some other events that have more results on Google, but he highlights events that didn't happen during the war in question. If instead of comparing apples to oranges, you compare apples to apples, by which I mean other events that occurred during this war, let's say the massacre in Kfar Etzion, in which 130 Jews were murdered by Arabs, or the Hadassah medical convoy massacre, in which 80 nurses and doctors were murdered, or the Ben Yehuda bombing, which left 60 Jews dead, or the 220 Jewish civilians who were killed by Arabs bombing of Jerusalem, you will quickly see that these events in which Arab killed Jews get way less attention in the media and academia. To make it clear, my point is that things have gotten out of proportion when, in the same war, Jews killing Arabs get so much more attention than the many incidents of Arabs killing Jews. I actually considered not making this video because in a way to do so is to fall into the pro-Palestinian trap of talking about what they want to talk about, but I decided it was important to make it because the pro-Palestinian side doesn't have many strong arguments to put forward. They hold on to two stories dating from the 1948 war, Dir Yassin, which was a battle in which a few dozen Arab civilians died, and the bombing of the King David Hotel, which served as a British army base and not a civilian hotel. Watch 100 pro-Palestinian videos, and these are the two historical events that get repeated again and again. So after I told the story of Dir Yassin, he said this. 
when they started shooting at Jewish people and allowing Arab irregular forces to launch attacks from the village. Now, unfortunately, Traveling Israel doesn't source any of his claims, nor does he link any references in the description, and okay, it's a YouTube video, but it does mean I have to look pretty hard to find out where his claims are coming from. First, why work hard? You could just write to me and I would give you my sources. But he does raise a fair question here, and it is one that I'm also asked by my supporters. Why don't I give any references for the claims I make? There are two reasons, the technical one and the substantial one. The technical one is that most of the books I use as sources are written in Hebrew. The time I would need to invest in checking to see if they have been published in English, and even if they have been, finding they are usually not easy to get hold of just isn't worth it for me, especially considering that there are only very few people who want to know all the details. I'd rather get to work on my next videos. But there are two substantial factors here as well. First, I am a tour guide who makes videos on YouTube. This is not a university seminar. When I'm guiding, I try to deliver the main insights with as little distraction from the topic in hands as possible. I can of course go much deeper and indulge in some name dropping of historians in book. In fact, some of the professors who wrote about the War of Independence and the events in Tiryasin, Benny Morris, Yoav Gilbert, Eliezer Tabor, were actually my university professors, but I don't think that will add much value to the video in this case. But the main reason I don't source my claims is that I almost always talk about general things that are easy to check. I said at the beginning of the video that you wouldn't want to be gay or trans in a Muslim country. I didn't give reference for this statement, but if you want to take a deeper dive, you can ask Google which countries are the worst to be gay in and see for yourself how many of them are Muslim. Nothing of what I say is hidden in secret documents that only I have access to. Most of what I say is obvious and easily accessible to all. But what did I include in the description of my video? I included a link to the Vox video that I was debunking. I think that as a YouTuber, that is the honest thing to do. But Lord Box doesn't agree with me on this one, apparently, as he didn't add a link to my original video. When he describes the events prior to the Yassin, he does mention that the Arabs rejected the partition plan and started the war. I will give him two points for that. Most pro-Palestinians somehow ignore the crucial fact that it was the Arabs who rejected the two-state solution and subsequently started the war. However, Lonerbox did miss something important. The Arabs didn't just reject the partition plan because they thought it wasn't fair. They rejected the very idea that the Jews should have a state. More on that soon. So he goes on to say that Israel was on the offensive, which is true. The Jews didn't want a war, but the Arabs forced it upon them. He fails to mention that in the first month of the war, the Arabs killed hundreds of Jewish civilians. Instead, he draws attention to the fact that Israel bought weapons from Czechoslovakia, and that is true. Israel knew that once the British had left on the 14th of May 1948, the local Arabs would be getting help from neighboring Arab states, and then it wouldn't be just a case of Jewish paramilitary groups fighting against Arab paramilitary groups, but five Arab armies would be invading Israel, and five Arab armies is a different ballgame. Now, if you know a bit of geography, that doesn't make sense, seeing as Israel has only four Arab neighbors, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. So who is the fifth? Iraq. And they sent a very strong army to fight us. There is one thing that unites the Arabs, and that is the hatred of the Jews and Israel. They all fought us with one goal only, to eliminate the Jews, to eliminate the state of Israel. And soon I will prove it. But for now, 
backed with a video. And the decision to target the village was made in the first days of the month. So where exactly are these repeated violations of the peace pact? Traveling Israel doesn't really say where this happened, nor does he tell you why he believes that, so we just have to guess. As I said, you could have written me and I would have given you my sources. My source is a book by Professor Yoav Gilbert called Independence versus Nakba, The Arab-Israeli War of 1948. Fighters from Dir Yassin attacked Jewish neighborhoods on the 2nd of April, and some of them went on attacking the castle on the 8th of April. There was a peace pact, but it was broken at least twice. And another historian called Milstein claims that there was a meeting with the head of the village of Dir Yassin in which he said that he couldn't control the situation. If you look at a map, you will see that Dir Yassin sits on a hill right next to the main road to Jerusalem within the valley. So seen from a strategic military point of view, there was clear justification for conquering the village. There is another good book about the Dir Yassin battle called The Massacre That Never Was by Professor Eliezer Tauber. Now, now wait, I know what you are thinking. Of course, Israeli historians will say that there was no massacre. So two points I want to make here. Professor Tauber based his book primarily on the testimonies of Arabs from Dir Yassin. I will leave two or three videos with him in down below. And I want to show you this short clip about who turned the village into the symbol it is today. We gathered in Jerusalem at the Hebron Gate. And we checked who was missing and who had survived. Then the Palestinian leaders arrived, including Dr. Khalid. I asked Dr. Khalidi how we should cover the story. He said, we must make the most of this. So he wrote a press release stating that at Dir Yassin, children were murdered, pregnant women were raped all sorts of atrocities. Arab radio stations passed on the false reports, ignoring the protests of the witnesses. We said there was no rape. He said we have to say this, so the Arab armies will come to liberate Palestine from the Jews. This was our biggest mistake. We did not realize how our people would react. As soon as they heard that women had been raped at Dir Yassin, Palestinians fled in terror. They ran away from all our villages. Dir Yassin was a propaganda bomb that exploded in the hands of its Arab makers. Instead of pressuring more Arab troops to come to help the local Arabs, it made the local Arabs run away. Lona Box puts a lot of quotes in his video, and almost all of them are from one book by Israeli historian Benny Morris. I want to bring another Benny Morris quote that Lona Box chose not to include that in a way summarizes it all. There was no Zionist plan or blanket policy of evicting the Arab population or of ethnic cleansing, and the demonization of Israel is largely based on lies, much as the demonization of the Jews during the past 2,000 years has been based on lies, and there is a connection between the two. Now, I can go on to debunk most of his claims, I can refute each of his quotes with one of my own. But after Dir Yassin, he moves on to the city of Haifa, where I admit I was dead wrong. I said that Moshe Carmel, the mayor of Haifa, asked the Arabs of Haifa to stay and not flee. And Lona Box was right to correct me here. It was not Moshe Carmel. He was the commander of the armed forces in Haifa. Shabtai Levi was the mayor. He's the one that asked the local Arabs to stay. I got the names wrong. I don't think that this is a particularly dramatic mistake to make. The important thing is that 
the Jewish mayor called upon the Arabs to stay and that you won't find a single case of Arab leadership calling for the Jews to stay. Now, I thought I was making a good point here, but as I was thinking about it, I came up with a much better, more important point to make. One that I'm not sure Lono Box thought of. In his video, he mentions the specific names of Israeli leaders many times. He mentions Ben Gurion about 10 times, Menachem Begin a few times, Yitzhak Rabin and others. But not once does he mention the names of the leaders of the Arabs in Palestine. Don't you think that it is a bit strange that in a 46 minutes video about the war, he goes into the smallest details, yet he doesn't mention the names of any Arab leaders? For instance, he takes his time explaining the use of loudspeakers. In my video, I brought up the fact that the Jewish forces brought along loudspeakers to warn the locals to get out before the coming battle in Dir Yassin. Think about it. The Lessi, the most extreme militant Jewish group, intended to bring loudspeakers to the battlefield so that civilians would have time to get away. I wish the Arabs would do the same. Dear Jews, I'm a suicide bomber and I'm going to blow up this path. All civilians should please get off at the next stop. Lono Box talks about the loudspeakers for a minute and a half, not saying that I made it up. He basically agrees with me, but what he does say is that the truck with the loudspeakers got stuck on the way, and it is debatable whether the Arabs actually heard the message. However, as for mentioning the Arab leaders, he doesn't do that at all. Of course, I don't know why Lono Box made this a uh, priority, but I do want to make an educated guess that might explain it. Could it be that it is important to him to depict the Palestinians as victims? There is no higher virtue than victimhood in the progressive chart, and because they are poor victims who have no control over their lives, they were subjected to atrocities perpetrated by the evil Israelis. This seems to be the narrative Lono Box wants to promote. The only active response left to the Arabs after saying no to an Arab state and starting a war to eliminate the Jews was to flee. The thing is that the Arabs in Palestine did actually have a leadership. I think it is kind of important to say a word or two about it. So the main leader of the Arabs was Mufti Amin al-Husseini. Before the war, he spent the 1940s in Germany with his friends. This is what he said. Our fundamental condition for cooperating with Germany was a free hand to eradicate every last Jew from Palestine in the Arab world. I asked Hitler for an explicit undertaking to allow us to solve the Jewish problem in a manner benefiting our national and racial aspiration, and according to the scientific method innovated by Germany in the hands of its Jews, the answer I got was, the Jews are yours. And also, the Arabs would not suffice with preventing partition, but would continue fighting until the Zionists were annihilated and the whole of Palestine became a purely Arab state. Kawakji, another Arab leader, said, we will have to initiate total war, we will murder, wreck, and ruin everything stands in our way, be it English, American, or Jewish. Azam, the Secretary General of the Arab League, said, This will be a war of extermination and momentous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Tatar massacres of the Crusader Wars. And this was the Arab leadership at that time. Do you now understand my educated guess as to why Lono Box doesn't mention it? At the same time, in the middle of the war, the British left and the Jews declared the establishment of the State of Israel. In the Israeli declaration, it says, We appeal in the very midst of the onslaught launched against us now for months to the Arab inhabitants of the State of Israel to preserve peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship. We extend our hand to all neighboring states and their people in an offer of peace and good 
neighborliness and appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and so on. I find it extremely noble that in the middle of the fighting, when Arab leaders were talking about the annihilation of the Jews, the Israelis said they want peace and they acted on it. 160,000 Arabs who didn't participate in the battles against the Jews kept on living in Israel and the Arabs also acted on what they believed in and zero Jews were left alive in areas held by Palestinians. At the end of the video, he asked me a direct question. But if people like Traveling Israel want to claim that expulsion wasn't at least one of Israel's goals, how does he explain what happened after the war? Because after the war, the majority of the depopulated villages were destroyed and most of this destruction took place directly at the hands of the Zionist forces after the fighting had ended. Some of the sites, including Deir Yassin, had new settlements built directly over them. Others became parks, recreational spaces, or military sites. Others were left in ruins. The result, as it was well understood by the leaders, was that it killed off any prospect of the Arab refugees ever returning. I'm happy to explain. As Lodenbox makes clear earlier in the video, No, I am no historian. And it shows. Quoting from a few books and reading them out in a video, doesn't make you an expert on a particular point in history. So how do I explain it? Israel, like many other countries such as Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, India, Pakistan, the two Koreas, and in a way the two Germanys were formed on territories of the French and British empires that collapsed after the Second World War. The same thing happened at the end of the First World War. The multinational empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire, the Ottoman Empire collapsed and gave rise to the idea of nation-state. As these nation-states were created, millions were killed and tens of millions were displaced, some because of a war, some because of hostilities, and some because they migrated to join their own nations. In the Balkans, some 10 million people were displaced in order to form nation states in the 20th century. Between Poland and Ukraine, a million and a half were displaced from 1944 to 1949. Also at this time, about 12 to 17 million Germans were expelled from Eastern European countries, and about 14 million people had to move between India and Pakistan. Millions died in the process, in Israel, 700,000 Arabs had to flee because the Arabs had lost the war that they had started. That's the nature of war, and it was no different in Israel than in the rest of the world. The only difference is that while the Germans and the Poles and the Ukrainians and the Pakistanis and the tens of millions of refugees got on with their lives and stopped calling themselves refugees, and weren't attempting to wipe out the land where they ended up living or their neighbors, only the Arabs cling to the title of being refugees while simultaneously carrying on trying to eliminate Israel and you're all paying for it. Here is something absolutely insane. Did you know that there are two refugees agencies in the world? One for all the refugees in the world and another one for the most privileged ex-refugees in the world, the Palestinians. Don't take my word for it, phone and box. Go ahead and Google UNRWA. And by the way, who took over the houses of the Arabs who fled from Israel? The answer to this question leads to another interesting story that Lono Box might like to look into. There were hundreds of thousands of Jews in Muslim countries. They were loyal citizens who never harmed the Muslims, and yet suffered pogroms in Yemen, in Iraq, in Morocco, in Iran. I made a video about this very topic. These Jews had to flee from Muslim countries, and whole Jewish communities were wiped out in the ethnic cleansing carried out by Muslims in almost all countries. Many of the Jewish refugees came to Israel and were settled in the houses left behind by the Arabs. 
Lona Box end his video with a warning. How do we wrap this up? Um, be careful when YouTubers just kind of say things without showing you any proof. And then he says something without showing any proof. And if you're wondering where to source your claims from, say about a historical massacre, maybe don't get your opinions from the literal terrorist leader of the group that did the massacre. I mean, that's just dumb. True, that would be dumb. But I didn't get my sources from the book Menachem Begin wrote. I know that it is hard to tell as I speak perfect Oxford English, but you might realize that I speak another language, Hebrew, and believe it or not, you will find many great sources in Hebrew. I want to finish this video, not with a warning, but by saying how much I enjoy doing this. I'm sitting here making a video on my cell phone by myself, no crew, no nothing and hundreds of thousands of people will see it and maybe they will learn something new, maybe they will get a new perspective, write comments, write to me or make videos in response. I just love this format, I love free speech and I am grateful for it and I will never take it for granted. Free speech is not free, it is extremely expensive. Many good people have paid for it with their lives so that I am able to enjoy it. I will never forget it and I will never forget them. If you would like to learn more about it all, I can't recommend this book enough. It is called Industry of Lies by Van Drory Mini. And to make Lonobox happy, I will add that it has a very long bibliography in the language Lonobox can speak English. Please subscribe, give this video a like, and share it with the people who need to see it. See you next week. Yada bye.